Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Good to go. Great. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stoa. I'm your host today, Raven, and I guess I'll do a check in. Feeling a lot of Thumos energy, which is really nice. It's returning. Um, it's, it's really great to be here at the Stoa today to introduce Johannes. Um, the, for those of you who don't know, the Stoa is a digital campfire where we gather to cohere in dialogue at the knife's edge of what matters most. And the meta crisis of the meta crisis is certainly on the top of our minds right now. And I'm so excited to hear Johannes bring us some uh, wisdom on this crisis that we're all a part of right now. So Johannes is a professor of philosophy and a Heidegger scholar and the founder of a new guilt of philosophers, an attempt to get out of the institutions and begin a new way of engaging with philosophy, a return to maybe the old way. And he's going to share with us some words of wisdom. And with that, Johannes, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Raven. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I Maybe briefly, how this was born probably out of a joke. Because uh, I said in the video, what's next? The meta crisis of the meta crisis. <laughs> and then Peter commented, the meta crisis of the meta crisis. Lol. Um, and, uh, but let's just say, Peter, we've memed it into existence, perhaps. Maybe that's appropriate to put it like that. But maybe there's some, something else really that's going on here. I did not, I didn't say it just, just to be provocative uh, or awful, um, even though I'm quite, you know, I have a tendency to be like that a bit sometimes perhaps. But I think that what the meta crisis or the discourse, let's just say, around the meta crisis gets at is that there is, in fact, a profound crisis that's occurring. Um, however, I found that the discourse around it will probably lead to an infinite regress. Um, to say it bluntly, it's because I think that any kind of um, any kind of problem solving will not do. Um, the task lies somewhere else. So I wrote this piece now over the past week because last week I saw something popping up on Twitter and I said, uh, the meta crisis of the meta crisis is here. Um, and I'll now get into it. I think it's, it's got, it's, it's a, it, I'm trying to say too much in too little time. It's not properly developed yet, um, but it's a first attempt perhaps. And I begin with the word crisis and then I move into Descartes and then on to, um, to Kant. And yeah, so I hope it's, uh, hope it, it's clear what I'm trying to say. Maybe it's not even clear to me, but we'll find out. So the meta crisis of the meta crisis. Perhaps it is helpful to begin with the meaning and the origin of the word crisis and what its concept signifies for us today. If we begin to take seriously that apparently something announces itself in the ubiquity of crisis, Perhaps it would even be fair to claim that crisis and its specific dimension is today that which addresses us most urgently. And assuming this is indeed the case, the question perhaps becomes, whence this utmost urgent crisis? The word crisis is, of course, of ancient Greek origin. What else? The Greek crisis means separation, dichotomy, conflict, strife, but also selection and decision. Hippocrates speaks of crisis, also as pertaining to disease. Crisis here means the moment when the fate of the patient is decided, either for recovery or for death. In tragedy, crisis is the singular incision or the moment when the hero's destiny becomes apparent. According to the Brothers Grimm, 
dictionary, the dictionary of the German language, Goethe writes somewhere, all transitions are crisis and is a crisis, not a disease. So that's the quote from Goethe. We could then perhaps translate or maybe cross over, as I like to think of it, from the shore of the Greeks to ours, ferry across the river of the eons, the word crisis as follows. The within itself turning of self-conflicting strife, thanks to which selection and decision transpire, so that the path entered upon irreversibly becomes one's own. And this entering upon a path, however, is the instance in which crisis disappears. A crisis appears when a transition is paving its way for itself, and another grounding needs to be prepared. And this seems to be coming from behind, as it were, barely seen rather than looming on the horizon. It is in the paving for itself uh, that the path this indicates that um, this also requires uh, a decision once the crisis is brought into focus. The word decision pleases the modern ear, it would seem, from making decisions, as the English vernacular says, indicates that something can be done, control can be executed, the crisis can and hence should be managed to minimize damage or in suffering perhaps and maximize utility. And still, despite the will to make decisions and control, there seem to be crisis over crisis, the climate crisis, the corona crisis, the financial, economic, social, political, institutional, intersubjective crisis. There is a housing crisis, a homelessness crisis, a public health crisis, a mental health crisis, crisis upon crisis that recur every year, almost some of them, diseases upon diseases when we follow Goethe. Yet, the question is, is anything ever truly decided? Bearing in mind that to decide means to cut off, from Latin, cedere, to cut. It may well be that all those crises are not at all to be solved. There is no decision to be found. Instead, those crises are what the all-willing subject perhaps clings to as this pun crisis is now what gives the subject absolute self-certainty, maybe. It's in the crisis, I'm trying to say, that we still find something to hold on to. As long as everything is in utter crisis, I can and must and will manage the pandemic crisis. I can even engage in abstract meta games of crisis that are entirely, it seems, detached from anything and purely in the realm of constructivism. Hence, without the suffering experience of the painful cut, which comes necessarily with any disease and any transition. It is as though, high from the balcony view, some stand comfortably overlooking the world pressed into the procrustes bed of models and representations, a blueprint of the meta crisis, which, so the assumption goes, only needs all the right conditions met a priori before any experience for the so-called meta and meaning crisis to be easily and maybe even comfortably overcome. Just take the ingredients of some rationality and causality. Don't forget the spiritual though. And here's your entertaining, epidermally interesting, to quote Nietzsche, neatly defined set of delusions, solutions, and maybe delusions too, but I mean solutions here, abstractly applicable to the meta crisis. The historicized sterility with which thinking is approached indicates that something has broken off and has gone astray. That philosophy is no longer in charge of what, is, of what it has always been in charge of namely the grounding and founding of world access. Alas, what is seemingly becoming ever clearer is that modernity itself is crisis. That is the grand claim of this humble essay. The attempts to solve problems in the cold and distanced way proposed to solve even thinking itself indicate to me an misunderstanding of the task of thinking. Thinking does not require solving or correct solutions. Thinking needs to be thought. 
the Taoists want to make sense of this grandiose remark that all modernity is crisis. The epoch which gives itself the name modernity of the present moment is what it means, begins with Descartes. This is not intended to give a precise date or year, but a transition, perhaps an incision, which the name of Descartes now stands for is indicated here. Hegel says on the meaning of Descartes, and I quote from his History of Philosophy, this is Hegel, it is only now with Descartes that we properly arrive at the philosophy of the new world. After a long time erring across the sea, Hegel continues, it is with Descartes that philosophy finally begins to see land again, for it is with Descartes, says Hegel, that philosophy begins to appreciate the importance of consciousness for truth of the I, of the ego. Descartes' doubts and Kant's, contribution, Kant's contributions are what have given birth to the modern world more than anything or anyone else. The oft cited so-called Cartesian paradigm has become the unquestioned boogeyman at this point, which can be pulled out the magician's head at any moment. A conversation requires a quick and easy deus ex machina to find someone or something to blame. Nothing of what is being said here intends to blame Descartes or anyone. In fact, the unquestioned repeated talk of the Cartesian paradigm, the Cartesian subject, is perhaps a rather so thoughtless uh, operation, precisely because it neglects the necessity of the thought of Descartes and what he responded to. Why is it that the soul becomes the res cogitans, the thinking thing, which in turn becomes the ground for philosophy. Why is it that casting doubt methodologically, and that is to say the negation of all certainty in order to arrive at absolute certainty, is at the heart of his thinking? Why is it that mental perception begins to take the upper hand? How is it that the human being becomes the subject, the ground of objectivity, circling around and within itself, but at the same time establishing not only self-certainty, but also, again, certainty over the objective world. Why had it become necessary to establish, and this is the most important question, why had it become necessary to establish this certainty over the objective world, which is not just one of control, but also secures that which philosophy has always assumed, the unity of being and thought. It is only when this unity breaks away, when it collapses, that the subject is truly trapped within itself. Perhaps what Descartes responded to with his methodological doubt is what we can call the pandemonic crisis that is modernity, namely the split between the unity of being and thought. Perhaps this had already announced itself to him, perhaps already an utter withdrawal was here found. The a priori, which Descartes finds in the res cogitans, the thing that thinks of itself without negating itself, but everything else, should itself instill this quiet and unease within us. Still, Descartes is an exercise of freedom, for his thinking attempts to begin anew and it casts doubt on everything and takes a distinct stance in the midst of beings. There is a tremendous philosophical autonomy in Descartes, thanks to its negativity. Yet at once, this skeptical negation of the world, it neglects, uh, for it neglects the negativity of the subject, sets in motion the self-positing of the subject. And the... Uh, and that this freedom, though, should be taken seriously and also should be honored, while bearing in mind that here also the isolation of the human being qua subject sets in insofar as everything is doubted and negated, but not the self. The self is transformed into a thinking thing, a substance of sorts. The being of this thinking thing knows no negativity, however. Still the audacity to cast doubt on everything, to negate the existence of all that is, but still to say, I think I am, is an exercise in testimony of tremendous human freedom. And as such, 
is at the heart of what modernity is. At the same time, the self-referential ego, as Ries Kokitanz, becomes the grounded ground, the foundation in which the human being finds a stance. This foundation, as we can see now, neglects, however, the world and depicts a reification of the self, a self which is now isolated. <clears throat> Even though I think that Descartes tried to establish again the unity between being and thought. With Descartes, there is an onset, a new beginning, as it were. There is also a necessity to it insofar as thinking always begins when it removes itself from tradition and dogma. At the same time, thinking must, however, also take into care and heed tradition, or rather that which is being delivered over. For in that which has been, the eternal strength of a new beginning always sways. The distinct negativity of modernity is hence one, one which doubts and denies what came before and at once forgets the negativity of being. It's a double negation that doesn't know of its own negation of the negation. This is how you get to the importance of Spinoza and Hegel, of the, that every determination is a negation with, to the double negation of, of, of Hegel. The neglected negativity of modernity transpires as critique or with Nietzsche as the spirit of resentment. Nietzsche's Zarathustra says, not only the reason of millennia, but also its madness is breaking out within us. What I have elsewhere referred to as the apocalypse of the subject seems to be just this. The total exhaustion of the will to eradicate negativity, which forgets its own annihilating force, pushing against its utmost limit and simultaneously the slow realization that the withdrawal cannot be stopped. All the while in the withdrawal, I mean, of, of um, the unity of being and thought. All the while dancing along liminal digital virtual a liminal digital virtual edge established by the plethora of historicized files of meaning particles to which the late modern subject clings if only for a split second for the subject is trying to arrive back at the certainty of the unity between being and thought and this unity finally collapsed with hume's radical skepticism hume awakens Kant from his dogmatic slumbers, not least because of the former's own fundamental dogmatic skepticism. The dogmatism of which Kant speaks, though, is the presupposed unity of being and thought, a presupposition which now needs to be cashed and needs to be shown that this synthetic a priori judgment is in fact valid. The critical project of Kant is to bring to the fore this foundational presupposition of which thought had dogmatic, which thought had dogmatically assumed for itself. Kant does not do so, does do so not in order to tear down the metaphysical presupposition, but to place it on firm grounds so that the unity of being and thought can be secured and saved. The <clears throat> transcendental deduction hence does not deduce, but wants to justify the usage of the categories and the concepts of the subject. Kant is an Aufklärer, an Enlightenment philosopher, precisely because he clarifies, clears up, discloses this fundamental presupposition and at once sees the perfect ethical duty to himself and humanity to establish again a possibility for the human being to access the world and trust the access to the world. Because the other solution is skepticism or nihilism. Skepticism and nihilism were basically the same meaning around that time. Establishing how we access and approach the world has always been the mandate of philosophy, even if contemporary academia perhaps has forgotten that and only looks at the so-called history of philosophy as some alienated, distant object. Even though Kant clarifies for us that thinking must necessarily make this presupposition, which is an a priori synthetic judgment for Kant, in order to get back out into the world, that is, in order to establish the unity of being and thought again, where thought is understood as representation for Kant, the objectivity of object is now predicated on the subjectivity of the subject, that means on its categories. With Kant, what we have access to 
are representations of appearances, but never things as they are in themselves. And um, just to say this briefly, the, on the path to Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, Salomon Maimon is extremely important to because he marries Kant's critical project with with dogmatic metaphysics and says we do recognize things in themselves through a, through their appearances to, to which we have access, but he still ends up in skepticism. Why? Because he denies the possibility of negativity. He doesn't see that every positing, every position also has its own negation with it. So this denial of negativity or this denial of, of death on some other level um, always leads to a skepticism or nihilism. Now, the, um, with Kant, what we have access to are representations of appearances, but not things as they are in themselves. Things as they are in themselves are pushed into the nameless realm, the noumenon, the noumenal. Noumenon means no name. Again, Kant still needs to establish the unity of being and thought once more. And he does it with this move. Or else the specter of skepticism and nihilism, which comes through with Hume and others, would begin to take hold and the human being would find no stance and no access to the world. At the same time, Kant and his attempt to secure this access to the world and the unity of being and thought, Kant also establishes, however, a nearly fictitious phenomenal world. That is to say now with Kant, all we seem to have access to are representations of appearances, quite close to an illusion. The crisis then that the first critique brings to the fore on multiple levels is the genuine meta-crisis of modernity. Namely, the sudden disappearance of the unity of being and thought about which modernity enlightens us in the first place, and through this enlightenment, the various attempts to establish some unity again, almost to heal the dichotomy between human being and world, the establishment of an illusory field of perception, however, with Kant, is necessary. And Fichte, Schelling, and, and Hegel will try to overcome this in their own ways. <clears throat> I would say Fichte, Schelling, Husserl, Heidegger, Paul Neitorp um, are all attempts and Heidegger, of course, too, with, that, with the transcendental philosophy of Dasein, are all attempts to struggle against subjectivism and to overcome it. I would like to say it again. Thanks to Kant and Hume and others, we see the dogmatism of traditional metaphysics, the dogmatic presupposition. Yet at once, what is torn open here, and the terrible wound that it, this inflicts, is the bursting away of the human from a, an access to the genuine world as to, to things as they are in themselves. You read Heidegger, for example, you read the passages on the short essay by him, The Thing, begins on the question, what is the thing in itself, precisely for that reason. It is crucial to point out that it is with Kant and only with his transcendental logic that the natural sciences find justification for their constructions of objects without inherent contradictions. So what the sciences do in their models is that they, they construct objects without contradictions. And this is the earthquake we name Kant. The attempt though must not be to solve, I think, must not be to solve abstractly and a priori this profound crisis, but to think it through to let its own overturning occur. I would like to quote from Kant from the very first um, two paragraphs of the first edition of his first critique, because I think it's quite telling. Kant says the following, human reason has the peculiar fate in one species of its cognitions that it is burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss, since they are given to it as problems by the nature of reason itself, but which it also cannot answer, since they transcend every capacity of human reason. Reason falls into this perplexity through no fault of its own. It begins from principles whose use is unavoidable in the course of experience and at the same time sufficiently warranted by it. With these principles it rises, as its nature also requires, ever higher to more remote conditions. But since it becomes aware in this way, 
that its business must always remain incomplete because the questions never cease. Reason sees itself necessitated to take refuge in principles that overstep all possible use and experience and yet seem so unsuspicious that even ordinary common sense agrees with them, but it thereby falls into obscurity and contradictions from which it can indeed surmise that it must somewhere be proceeding on the ground of hidden errors. But it cannot discover them or the principles on which it is proceeding, since they surpass the bounds of all experience, no longer recognize any touchstone of experience. The battlefield of these endless controversies is called metaphysics. We are then, it seems, addressed by something and hence we are to respond again not by solving in a calculative manner the problems at hand a priori but by thinking through what is at stake whether and how being and thinking can still belong together so that this utmost crisis becomes the following something that from within itself overturns itself the meta crisis of the meta crisis this course could then be summarized as follows. The sudden insight into the groundlessness of the attempts to solve abstractly and a priori all presently available concrete problems, constructing a world without contradictions. The dead formal logic of the various problem solving attempts. Attempt to construct the perfect world without contradictions, which inevitably will lead to inherent contradictions, to antinomies of reason, as Kant himself admits in the first critique. All the while, <clears throat> failing to understand that thinking does not require solutions, but that the mandate of thinking is now to bring together again, to reconcile the fissure between being and thinking, humans and earth, gods and mortals, perhaps from the deep shared memory of the all unifying one. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. <laughs> so rich, oh my gosh. <laughs> There's so many things here. Okay, so for any everybody in the audience, if you have any questions or statements or points of clarification that you would like to address to Johannes, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and then I will call your name and you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly to Johannes. And I have to kind of, let's, there's a couple of things that you brought up. Yeah. That I think I'd like some clarification on there seems to be this, this theme of contradiction. And then earlier you said double negation, the double negation um, of modernity. Could you go back and clarify what that means? Um, I, okay, I think what I said, and, and this wasn't written. Um, oh. So what I, what I think I said is that it, it, it negates negativity. Right, so in that sense, it's it's some kind of a double negation. The 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 the, the program of um, um, of of modernity is to get rid of negativity. Now, if you take this to a logical level, that means to negate negativity. But that so, but if you want what do you, if you want to get rid of negativity, you have to negate it. What is that? But mean? how do you negate it? What what do you mean get? Sorry. Paul. <laughs> How do you get rid of, what does it mean to get rid of negativity? <clears throat> we have to ask the modernists. Um, it's, it's, this is one of the programmatic um, lines in, in, in modernity. It's one of the main trajectories is to be able to posit. I mean, it's, it's most proclaimed, for example, in the movement called positivism, which to positivity, uh, means to have a world that's purely positive that's that we can that we can manifest and control um without any negativity negativity on on our level of course is is death is finitude etc um but the program of one of the main i think <clears throat> trajectories of modernity 
is trying to rid ourselves from, for example, just stay with death, from death. Um, it's now a, a major, it's just a prolonging of life, for example, is an attempt to get rid of the negativity of death or the negativity of finitude. Um, so it's, it's on extremely many levels that you can find this uh, attempt to get rid of um, the negative. But it, all the while, it's, it's neglecting uh, its own sort of <clears throat> inherent negativity. Mm. And it runs, I I'm, I'm started reading um, Salomon Maimon, who is the, the, so, who's the, the bridge between Kant and Fichte and Schelling and Hegel. Um, and even he has to admit that there, every, that there must be some kind of negation in every positing. So Spinoza is, is, an, is an early case, an early modern philosophy, who understands that every determined, one of his quote, omnis determinatio est negatio. Right? You, you, you cannot determine anything without negation. Hegel will radicalize this further and say, yeah, the, the proper self-autonomy is the negation of the negation. And, but this is a conscious, if you like, this is a conscious, this is a negation that's aware of itself, right? Uh, a, a negation that's not aware of itself um, loses itself in negation. Here's the strange thing. The more that's posited, the more lost there is um, along the line. It's a world that's posited becomes artificial. Mm. Okay. Yes, that makes that, it's beginning to make sense. And so, so uh, okay. So we have this negation, and we have the uh, the forgetting of the double negation in modernity. Is that kind of what you're saying? It's uh, and then there's the conscious uh, negation. Is that related to contradiction? Are those there's a distinction between contradiction and, yeah. and negation? Okay. Can yeah. You clarify that. Um, well, the, 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 a purely positive philosophy or positive way of thinking must ne negate negation, but also contradiction. So it must construct, um, so it must construct, uh, the, it must construct, for example, objects without inherent contradiction. But, um, in, in order to say that, uh, you know, I don't know, this, this pen is this pen properly in an interrelationality? It, it must be not this book. Uh, it, I've, I run into extreme troubles to, to to be able to try and determine what this pen is, um, if if I can't say what it isn't. It's the same with with myself, right? This, so the, I mentioned the the freedom of Descartes. Uh, the, the, the the audacity is to say all of this isn't. I think I am is the res is the response, um, but that's exactly right. It, it, he comes back to himself. He comes back to his thinking, I and mean, of course, logically, not not personally. Um, and I think the 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 there is a difference between negation and contradiction, um, which perhaps we could say is um, a, a contradiction works by um, a contradiction works by negation, but isn't just a uh, kind of cannot be reduced to negation. Um, so a contradiction must already, there must already be, I think, a bit more uh, at work, uh, if that makes sense. And the, um, the, the reason why, why so Kant finds this, I mean, what's so, I should have probably said a lot more about Kant than the other stuff, um, because someone just asked, what's the meta crisis of the meta crisis? I think the, the crisis that, that we're facing really is this split or this collapse between the unity of being and thought, which is, which can be, you can, this sounds very abstract, but this can be, for example, the question, is there even an external world or am I just trapped within myself? Um, or is, is the split between the human and the natural world, which to some degree always is necessary, but it always must also come back to it, right? Um, but a purely sort of a purely positivistic world cannot use this kind of, it cannot think contradiction. So to think contradiction, you have to also think negation. I have to be able to negate my animality in order to become human to speak with Hegel. And in so becoming human, not totally denying my natural body or world, 
uh, or animality, I'm actually affirming it through the negation. But then I have to be able to think uh, contradiction. I have to be able to accept that there are contradictions that actually thinking and spirit moves by negativity and then hence by contradiction. Um, it, it, it's, there's a movement in there, right? It's all alive. One of, one of the things you, you learn when you read Hegel is that logic is something that's living and breathing. The difference with formal logic is that formal logic is dead. It, it doesn't allow for it. It, it crowds out natural language. Uh, it has to formalize everything. It's all a priori without experience um, and then reapplies itself to. So it, it's non-ontological, strangely enough. Frege, for example, anti-ontological. What is now, I think, what we're now witnessing is that it's now re-ontologizing and then making judgments about the natural world through models, etc. cetera. Um, and the, so uh, I'm not sure if this makes it clearer, um, but kind of the, there is, there's a, a, a connection between uh, contradicting and negating. And so far as you uh, negate, you, you're already on the movement towards contradicting. Um, but you're kind of you're 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 bringing it all in, right? And if you allow for a double negation, so by by like being aware of it and allowing for it, um, it you're not solving the problem of contradiction, but it it becomes um, a living whole, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Rain. Do you want to follow up with your question at all? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe I'll follow up because that was helpful. Uh, I feel like I'm Thanks. getting a better understanding. Well, um, I'm I'm trying to. <laughs> but yeah, I I'm understand. Not, yeah, I'm not a philosopher, um, but I yeah. like this thought. Um, so, was actually the question that's coming up for me right now is if um, construction. I'm, I'm going to phrase things this way: if construction is the negation of um sort of like this primordial nature things as they are undifferentiated um then then the negation of the negation would be the deconstruction of of that modernist creation so um you may disagree with that uh isomorphism but do, do you equate deconstruction with the double negation or where would you fit in deconstruction or or a metamodernist reconstruction into uh, okay. the yeah okay i think um i i answered to um to adam it's i don't know a month ago or so on twitter when it comes to that so i'm not well well steeped in uh in, in, in derrida and, and others um but i think so look looking at it from from maybe where I'm coming from, what what what, what this gets at um, is to a certain degree um, trying to um, deconstruct the overly uh, co constructivistic approach to, say, existence, the world, right? That that's I think what they're trying to do, uh, and at the same time. Um, it, so that's that's the negation. Of course, the trouble is you you must also you must not one. I think one shouldn't stop at just deconstructing because then you're left with with nothing. Um, when you're just left with nothing, then it gets a bit troublesome. Um, but but the I think the approach was uh, in that sense justified to tr to try and get back from this overly a cold, dead, formally rationalistic way of of, of being in the world. Yes. That's how I've, I've always understood it, at least. All right. Let's see here. So we have Stephen, and then Adam also has a question. So let's see what Stephen has to say, and then we'll go to Adam. Stephen, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi. Um, my camera's playing up. Um, I, I can turn it on, actually. It's just it's not very pleasant to look at. Uh, there we go. Um, my question, I, I, mean, I, uh, I just sort of being very blunt and I'm trying to ground things um, and just come at it sort of bluntly. The question is, would it be fair to say the loss of the war generation who enforced wisdom traditions, albeit dogmatically, has left a meta vacuum? And this is what we're um, 
this is this is I don't know if it, it feels very crass this but it feels like this is what we're wrestling with it's a very empiricist question <laughs> coming from from someone of uh, the the proud British uh, empiricist tradition I know Steve quite well so I can say this to him um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I can't say anything to that because I'm not a historian, right? Uh, I, so this, this could be, you know, but, but then again, you would have to wonder, I mean, Nietzsche, so this is going to be very weird as a response to this question. Nietzsche says somewhere that it could be that all of Europe can be kept in 30 books. It doesn't need anyone. It just needs the books. And to some degree, that's true. When you look at the period of the Middle Ages and then the, the resurfacing of, of Aristotle and Plato and others, and the uh, Renaissance movement. Um, so it's, I think the, the question here is less uh, empirical, but more really on the level of, 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 of this split. Um, and the split is, at, it's this, and this is the, the, this weird double movement. Uh, so Descartes must find a, a, something to hold on to. And that, and that means to secure some kind of control over the unity of being and thought, which could just be subject over object. But at the same time, this also opens up the troublesome trajectory of the dichotomy of human being and natural world, let's say, to make it a bit more accessible. And Kant then is an enlightener, an enlightenment philosopher, not because he runs around and tells everyone what to do. No, because he's, he's enlightening us about this dogmatic presupposition that thinking had always made. And this is the enlightenment, sort of, uh, uh, this is the, the, the achievement, but then at the same time, this leads to the pr trouble even more so than with Descartes, that we no longer have access to things as they are in themselves. This is, it sounds so benign. But when you say we don't have access to things as they are in themselves, then we don't have access to anything real, right? We, we, we're only dealing with, we're dealing with appearances. And here's the weirdest thing. It's transcendental logic by which we fly airplanes. Um, we can fly airplanes because we can paradigmatically set a priori that the kerosene, and this is just a positing, will react the same way over and over and over again. I know this is very pesky continental in German, but um, I apologize, Steve. He suffered through so many seminars with me. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so it's, it's this split, right? Uh, this, this extreme split, and, but here's, here's the wonderful thing, but maybe this question, maybe I can turn it around and make it less painful for everyone. Um, even though there are, unfortunately, always again, these tremendous losses with war um, of entire generations, not, not entire generations, but many of a generation dying, um, and a lot is lost, there is something that we are attuned to from which we can still find meaning and it does need only a few texts and it does need only a bit of awakening right there's something to anamnesis there is something to uh, name it to memory in this regard but uh, maybe i'm just saying it again what i think is going on i think that this split and collapse of this trusting relationship between human and world being and thought, that's what's at stake. And <clears throat> what we now, if there's anything that we should do, is that we shouldn't try and solve this, we should try and think the coming together of being and thought. And this can take many different forms, right? This can be, uh, this can be, this can be very, you know, localism is one way of, of dealing with it politically, etc. Um, but on this, other level. And, and here's, here's the other strange thing about philosophy. Philosophy is the way that, or is the method, or I don't know what it is actually, but I don't, I don't know, method, the way in which, uh, the thinking through which we find access to the world. And I think this is also why there is now this increased interest 
in philosophy and this openness to listen to weirdos like me on the internet. But who else? Let's hear from Adam. Yes. Good to meet you finally, Adam. Hi, Johannes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, good. Um, thanks, thanks for this. Um, I'm, I mentioned to you already that I'm quite happy you're doing this, even if uh, it seems like I'm just reading the comments in the chat and um, appreciating that if, if this is new territory, that it can, it can sound a bit arcane and, and difficult and what's the point of all of this. But um, I really do think that this is the context that you're the, 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 the context you're speaking to Johannes is is the context that the meta crisis needs to be understood within um, and I think a lot of what you're setting up is has it has become so deeply sedimented into how we think and approach the world that some of those assumptions and, and suppositions um, maybe don't show up for people um, as part of the problem. Um, you just think about how casually, the assumption of subjectivism is so casually inserted into yeah. almost, almost every mode of thinking. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly the problem that, that you're, you're raising. And um, so I think, you know, okay, so we have Descartes, we have Hume, we have Kant, we have, you, you know, all of these different sort of, um, I think of them as sort of like dethroners, decenterers, uh, critical philosophers who, who, who make this break with thought and being. And then the task now is to, to rethink in light of that critical insight without, without retreating prior to Kant again, to think that relation of thought and being with Kant or after Kant or something like that, or taking Kant seriously in that discussion. And so I'm wondering with the setup that you have here that I, that I uh, agree with, um, where do you, where do you, where does your thinking then go? Like if this is the, if this is sort of the problematic, if this is sort of yeah. the dynamic that we're faced with, I have some thoughts on it. Um, it's very much what I'm trying to understand and trying to think and trying to put into words, which I think is a, a whole other um, category here. Um, the, and for me, I appeal to things like, like, like older concepts, like, like metaxi, like the in-between or mm -hmm. like a kind of mm -hmm. platonic participation. Or when people talk about Descartes and Kant, they'll sometimes talk about a, a turn to the subject, right? Philosophy enters this mode of turning to the subject instead of trying to uh, assert metaphysically what is the case about the world, they turn to the subject to try to understand how does the subject's constructive faculties uh, deliver the world that we see, the world of appearances that we see? But that was an epistemological turn, mostly. It's couched in epistemological terms. And I hear people today saying, yes, the turn to the subject was important, but maybe we can do, maybe we can turn to the subject in a metaphysical way. Maybe we can understand the metaphysics of the subject as something like, um, an outgrowth of the world that it is trying to describe. An outgrowth of, in other words, the Kantian categories are emergent phenomena of, of a kind of a noumenal realm that it may not know fully, but it, it is nevertheless a product of. Um, and so I, I'm just, these are kind of like yeah. the loose thoughts I have when trying to think thought and being again now. Um, and I'm wondering, like, what do you think about that? Where, where does your thinking go now that you've set this up? Um, yeah, that's, that's the, you know, <laughs> that's the crux of the matter. It's, um, I think we, well, <clears throat> so what we, I think what we cannot do is we cannot brush aside modernity. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say, well, Descartes got it wrong, obviously, because there is something to the I, to the ego, that's important, um, that we must, uh, understand. Um, one of the one of the um, responses to this entire problem, I, I think the greatest one so far is probably Hegel's with the establishing of the um, identity 
of non-identity so that there is um, because someone just brought it up subject object is inseparable and that's exactly right for hegel sub you know i i am in so far i am not this table but i am also this table to some degree i mean this is um, weird to say this but it, it you are what you are by not being something else but you are still related to everything else by not being everything else and this is how you become an individual heidegger's way of thinking is um another with the <clears throat> i think um what you can see with with, with Husserl, for example, is you know, zurück zu den Sachen, back to the things, for example. I think that's the translation. It's exactly the same question, right? We, we need to get access again to, to things as they really are, to being, and not so, because you brought up metexis. Metexis means participation. Participation of what? Of the particular and the universal. Mm -hmm. So it means that, that the tree in front of me for Plato is, it really is, it is a tree insofar as it participates in treeness um, and and which we're trying to to construct worlds that are like that right or even just in everyday language you can hear it but it's strange also when when so, so adam brought up subjectivism um, listen to language there might be some german speakers here uh, so there's at least one more besides me um, when you listen to german speaking it's german vernacular uses the word vorstellung in the vernacular the entire time vorstellung means representation idea and it's my for so the first sentence of schopenhauer's world as will and representation is the world is my representation and that rings true for uh, this is you know you can it's not solipsistic for schopenhauer but it has become the solipsism now where it's it's just my representation and the representation is just a mental image at this point too it has no more access to something that's out there. It's, it's, no, it's not really a regulative idea either. It's, it's trapped in, in, in the mind. Right? And the, so my, my thinking would be, I think where I'm going um, is a, a, a bit of an idiosyncratic thinking together of, of Hegel and, and Heidegger. Because I think what, what I didn't actually, I did say at the end, hen panther and I, or I said the all unifying one, um, the, this is a quote from, from Heraclitus, uh, I think especially with what, what's happening, you know, the globalized world, we're looking at each other, there's people in wherever you all of you are, um, there is a unification also occurring at the same time, right? So what we, I think what we have to be able to appreciate is this understanding that yes, one is many, but how do we think this oneness and how do we think the many in the one? Um, I think that's important. That's where I'm going with this. And also, so it, it, it would be as kind of a strange combination of, of Heidegger and Hegel in the sense that I want to understand um, opposites no longer dialectically, but as belonging together. And I find also in Heidegger's being, notion of being in the world, not a solution, but a way of, of, of pushing the human being back out into the world. And th this, is, this is why my thesis was on death, basically. I think really it comes down to appreciating again, uh, death, negativity, finitude, non-availability and non-controllability too, which is something for Occidental human beings, for, the, for Westerners is extremely difficult to understand, especially after in, 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 in modernity. We, 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 it, it's, it lies, if you want to have it you know, practically, it lies in the art of letting go. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a convoluted answer, but it was a very good question. The question was better than the answer, I would say. Adam, do you have any follow-up? Uh, um... I do, but I'm, it's a, uh, I, I don't, I, I feel like we could turn this into a whole other event and discussion. Let's do it. So Let's do I it think, then. yeah, I think we should, we should have that conversation, but um, I'll, 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 I'll leave it to other folks so that we don't Thanks, uh, suck all the air out of the room. Yeah. Well, we're wrap we're coming to the, the end of the hour and I'm also feeling that energy that there's a lot more that we could dig into here. Um, and we'll We've got contrarians in the room as well, so. 
Or we can always continue this uh, in some other form. I mean, because you mentioned in the beginning, you know, uh, this is something I forgot to say that I, I thought I would say, and of course I forgot. Uh, is you are kind of building um, something that's very important for philosophy, which is an institution outside the in official institution. Um, so, it, you know, one talk with one couple of good questions should lead to the next one. Um, because now I will have to go back over this and rewrite a few things, uh, make a few things perhaps clearer, um, and then give it again, or hold it again, or put it on my channel, whatever happens. Um, and then we, we continue. One of the things that we could do, for example, is a bit of a sort of a podium discussion, perhaps also, where we come prepared with two short talks or three, um, and then a longer discussion we plan for a bit more, maybe two hours or so, then all in. I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah. I feel like an hour for dense philosophy is just, is just not sufficient. <laughs> I'm always going over time with my seminar. I know you are. We're always hanging out for like two hours plus. It's great. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Johannes, thank you so much for bringing us this rich. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks Marilyn. Yes, of course. And Thanks, all. Great. Lovers and haters, I'll see you next time. <laughs> and with that, Peter, would, uh, would you like to close out with events? Yes. Yeah, Johannes, thank you uh, again for, for coming to the STOA. Uh, if you want to send me this, the, um, the transcript of, of that, that talk, I can post it on the YouTube video. I'll probably do it tomorrow. And you can do a post on your channel too, and then we can kind of figure out how to do another uh, collaboration after that. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of upcoming events. We're going to get kicked out of the Zoom room quite soon because there's a, a social design club with the human systems people. Uh, that is at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. What else do we have today? Uh, Tyson, are, are you still in this, uh, the room? If you can unmute yourself and tell us about your uh, event that you have coming up. Sure, thank you. Um, Michael Mead will be here today at 3 o'clock Eastern. He is a mythologist, a storyteller, and an author. And he'll be bringing in a mythic perspective around collective rites of passage, collective initiation, and how that relates to our personal genius and how we um, explore that in communitas. So bringing in that storyteller element. I look forward to it and I'd love to see you there. Thank you, Tyson. Travis, are you, is your event back on this week? It is, yes. So we'll be doing uh, Breaking the Frame tonight at, uh, at 7.30 p.m. And we're just gonna tinker with our deeply held worldviews uh, and look at those. And uh, right before that at 6 p.m. Eastern time, we have The Dangerous Space. You know how we'd always talk about safe spaces. We have a dangerous space where we talk about dangerous ideas, and that's with Ariel Friedman, and that's at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Ours for that. Uh, the store is based on a gift economy. Uh, you go to the website, and if you, if you, we have all these illustrations of our facilitators. If you go to the one that looks like a Filipino woman, that's actually Raven. Uh, you can gift to her directly because she does an excellent job at emceeing these events. So uh, thank you everyone for coming out today. Thank you again.